Welcome back to the Goddess Bible Study. We are in Lesson 5, the final lesson in our study. And we're going to be talking about Jesus as the Son, the Son of God. So if you have your study guide, go ahead and get it out and turn it to Week 5. I do want to apologize for last week or the last lesson. I had some tef technical difficulties when it came to uploading my video. For some reason, when I went to upload it on YouTube, I didn't upload the full video. I had to delete it and re-upload lesson four. So again, I do apologize. I know it took, it left out maybe like 25 minutes. Last week, we talked about God as the judge. And what we learned during that is that God gave Jesus, his son, all the authority to judge all the, all the living and the dead. We also learned that we are supposed to judge ourselves now and to get ourselves right with God. And when we do go through that final judgment, Jesus is going to judge us each, every one of us individually, according to our own ways. We talked about sin. And how when we are in sin, we turn away from God. But by grace and mercy, Jesus paid the atonement for our sins. So we have the ability to repent and turn back to God the Father. We also had an assignment. And our assignment was to spend time in reflection, asking the Holy Spirit to convict us of any sins that we need to confess and repent and put under the blood of Christ. This week, I really want us to take our time. It is the final lesson, but I feel like it's one of the most important ones because through Jesus, we get to see the character or the face of the Holy Father. Now, just like every lesson in this Bible study, we are supposed to slowly go through, pause and have time for reflection, have time for prayer. So if you haven't done that with the other lessons, I really ask that you do take the time to really pray, really reflect on the scriptures that we're going to be reading. This will help you in your prayer life. This will help you feel closer to God, especially when you start to break down the scriptures and really reflect on the meaning of them. All right, let's go ahead and start with a prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I'm grateful for this opportunity to work on this Bible study with those who are watching with me and studying with me. I thank you, Father, for all that we have learned throughout these last four weeks. Now we're on week five, God, and I ask that you really reveal yourself to us through the eyes of Jesus Christ, through his character. May the scriptures come alive to all of us as we read and study. I ask the Holy Spirit to come in and guide me as I'm doing this final lesson in the study. I'm giving control of my tongue. I'm giving control of myself to the Holy Spirit so I may only speak truth. I take being a teacher very seriously when it comes to teaching your word, Lord, and I do know the responsibility that comes with it. So I need the Holy Spirit here to guide and to help and to take over. And may you bless those that are watching this lesson and doing this lesson with me. And may you make the scriptures come alive to them as they read it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, let's go ahead and get into week five as Jesus as the Son. Do you remember the saying, a man is as good as his word? 
Well, I think about that every time I start thinking about Jesus because Jesus is the Word of God. He is the living Word of God. He never did anything or said anything unless it came from the Father first. And that made me think about ourselves, or myself in particular. Am I as good as my Word? Do I do the things that I say I'm going to do? When you give your Word on something, you're giving an oath. And that is something that I was convicted of. And it may be little things like small things, you know, about suppose for examples, like needing to go somewhere, saying I'm going to go somewhere and then I'm not going to do it. Or saying I'm going to do something, like a simple task that my husband asked me to do and I don't do it after I say I'm going to. That is just something that was on my mind or has been on my mind since starting the study. So let's begin. Scripture tells us we must go through Jesus to get to the Father. We also know that Jesus is the image of God, and he never did anything unless he saw the Father do it first. This week, we are going to follow Jesus and learn about the character of God through him, the Son of the Highest. Before we read John 1, 1 through 5, I want us to go ahead and read John 8, 56 through 58. And I'm going to use the Amplified Version. Actually, John 8, 31 through 59. So Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word continually, obeying my teachings and living in accordance with them, then you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth regarding salvation, and the truth will set you free from the penalty of sin. They answered to him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be set free? Jesus answered, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, everyone who practices sin habitually is a slave to sin. Now the slaves does not remain in a household forever. The son of the master does remain forever. So the son makes you free. Then you are unquestionably free. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you plan to kill me because my word has no place to grow in you and it makes no change in your heart. I tell the things that I have seen at my father's side in his very presence. So you also do the things that you heard from your father. They answered, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you are truly Abraham's children, then do the works of Abraham and follow his example. But as it is, you want to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This is not the way Abraham acted. You are doing the works of your own father, they said to him. You are not illegitimate children, We have one spiritual father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, but he is not, you would love and recognize me, for I came from God out of his very presence and have arrived here. For I have not even come on my own initiative as self-appointed, but he is the one who sent me. Why do you misunderstand what I am saying? It is because your spiritual ears are deaf and you are unable to hear the truth of my word. You are of your father the devil, and it is your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because he, there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar 
and the father of lies and half truths. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me and continue in your unbelief. Which one of you has proof and convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God and belongs to him hears the truth of God's word. For this reason, you do not hear them, because you are not of God, and you are not in fellowship with him. The Jews answered him, Are we not right when we say you are a Samaritan, and that you have a demon, and are under its power? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. On the contrary, I honor my father, and you dishonor me. However, I am not seeking glory for myself. There is one who seeks glory for me and judges those who dishonor me. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, if anyone keeps my word by living in accordance with my message, he will indeed never see and experience death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon and are under its power. Abraham died, and also the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never ever taste the de- taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophet died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is worth nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Yet you do not know him, but I know him fully. If I said I did not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham greatly rejoiced to see my day, my incarnation. He saw it and was delighted. Then the Jews said to him, You're not even fifty years old, and you claim to have seen Abraham. Jesus replied, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, Before Abraham was born, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus concealed him and left himself and left the temple. Did you guys catch that? On verse 58, Jesus replied, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now we're going to go ahead and take a look at Exodus 3, 7 through 14. The Lord said, I have in fact seen the affliction, suffering, desolation of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their task master, their task masters, the oppressors, for I know their pain and suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to the land that is good and spacious, to a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of plenty to a place of the Canaanite and the Heidi and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, and then bring my people the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to Egypt, Who am I that I should go out to Pharaoh and I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve and worship God at this mountain. The Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers and sisters has sent me to you. And they say to me, 
What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, You shall say this to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Then God also asked Moses, This is what you shall say to the Israelites. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, Israel, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. So you guys see that. He told Moses his name is I Am. Well, let's take a look at Genesis. We're going to look at chapter 14 and we're going to start with verse 19. And Melchizedek blessed Abram and said, Blessed, joyful, favored be Abram by God most high, creator and possessor of heaven and earth. So we see here that this is the king of Saddam and he is saying that Ab Abram was blessed by God, and he's calling God, God most high, the God, the creator, and the possessor of the earth. Now let's go to verse 22. But Abraham said to king of Saddam, I have raised my hand and sworn an oath to the Lord God most high, the creator and possessor of heaven and earth. So here, Abraham's telling the king of Saddam that he has raised his hand and sworn an oath to the Lord, the God of the Most High, the creator and possessor of the heaven and earth. So we see here, these are titles of God or Father. And then a little note that I wrote here is, we, all, we know all things, seen and unseen, were created by Jesus, who is the Word of God and who comes from God because He is God. He's part of the Trinity. All right, so now let's take a look at chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward for obedience shall be very great. All right, so you guys get that? The word of the Lord. Who is the word of the Lord? Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So a vision, which means that he is seeing. So yeah, so he is seeing the word of God. Now let's look at verse 7. And he said to him, I am the same Lord who brought you out of your children's to give you this land as inheritance. So he says to him, I am the same Lord. Now let's take a look at chapter 17, verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. I am God Almighty. Walk habitually before me with integrity, knowing that you are always in my presence and be blameless and complete in obedience to me. See that there? He says, I am God Almighty. So who is I am? I am is God Almighty. I am is Jesus. Jesus says, I am. Now let's read John 1, 1 through 5 in the Amplified Version. In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. He was continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. 
All things were made and came into existence through him. And without him, not even one thing was made that has come into being. In him was life and power to bestow life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines on in the darkness. And the darkness did not understand it or overpower it or appropriate it or absorb it. And is unreceptive. It. So according to this scripture, the word is Jesus, which we all know, and he was there during the creation of the world, and he is the word of God the Father, and he spoke and is part of God because he comes from God. Jesus has life in him, which is light, and life and power to bestow life, light, and shines in the darkness. It cannot be consumed by the darkness, and the darkness does not understand it or absorb it. We go back to John 8, 12. This time I'm going to look in the Christian Standard Bible. It says, Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. All right, now let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. And I'm just going to grab my amplified version here. Now, as we can see, as it starts off, and we go to chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, let's go to... Verse 5, and God called the light day, and he called the darkness night. Now it's 6, and God said, let there, let there be an expanse. As you can see, all throughout creation, you know, Jesus is the word of God, and all throughout creation, as you go through all of chapter 1, Almost every little section, God said, God called, God said. As you can see here, Jesus was a part of creation. Everything was created through him because God said, and Jesus is the living word of God. Now let's read John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what we can see here and what we know here is the only way to the Father is Jesus. He is the way. He is the door. He is the truth. He is the word that God spoke and the life. You know, something interesting I wanted to share real quick. And I trust this isn't completely off topic, but it, it's connected. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the series, The Game of Thrones. Well, I recently watched it and it was kind of upsetting for me because I had to fast forward through so much of the first season, especially most of the second too. But um, what I learned by watching that show is basically like the rules or the roles of the court of the monarch. So um, what I mean is living here in the United States, we don't have a king. We don't have a ruler. We just have it. We have a president, a vice president, and we have um, like our judicial court. We have, or the Supreme Court actually, and we have all these different little offices and positions that go underneath the president. So when I was watching the Game of Thrones, I was paying attention to the roles of the monarchy or the hierarchy where um, we have the king or queen and the king or queen has a hand, which is kind of like the same as the vice president. And then I started putting two and two together. And I know this probably sounds silly, but you know, Jesus is at the right hand of the father. He is at the right hand of God and he's also the word of God. And throughout that show, I noticed that the hand of the king 
you know, he was the most trusted advisor. He was the one that came into power in place of the king or queen when the monarchy was not able to be present. He was in charge of different affairs. Like at their little cabinet meetings that they would have, the hand of the king would sit in position. When they had a court, or when they had court going on, and people would come in and bring up, you know, all of their, pretty much, you know, things that were going on in their life they needed help with, they would, or to complain, they would go to the king and complain. But the hand of the king was always there and sometimes interceding for these people. So I started to be able to have a better connection of the different roles, you know, and of the different, um, the language used in the Bible when it talks about the courts, the heavenly courts, when it talks about, you know, the kings and, you know, like, for example, like King David and Solomon and all of that going on. You know, I have a better understanding now about it. And I just thought that was very interesting. Um, so anyways, let's continue. So Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. So before we continue with John 14, 6, I'm looking at this right now. And... We'll read 35. So we'll read, actually, we'll start with John 13, 35 and go down to 14. Okay, it says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love and unselfish concern for one another, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now but you will be able to follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why, cannot I why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. See, that's another thing too that I was learning um, when I was watching the show is I was learning how loyal people were to the king or queen. Like I was learning how they respected the monarch, how they um, approached him how they were very loyal and how they, like for an example, the knights and all the cabinets and the different um, nobles and so forth, how they would respect the king so much that they would lay down their life for him. Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? I assure you and most solemnly say to you, before a rooster crows, you will deny and completely disown me three times. Now in 14, do not let your heart be troubled, afraid, cowardly, believe confidently in God and trust in him. Have faith, hold on to it, rely on it, keep going and believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and I will trust you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. Okay, something else too that um, I just remembered is when they talk about like my father's house or talking about like his name and his... Um, so for an example, the lords and ladies and noblemen in the show, like they had people under them. They had people in their household and in their house. So that for an example, they have like the house of Stark and the house of Lannister and etc. right? So in Jesus and his father's house, in God's house, those are people that are under him. And when we become Christians and we devote our lives to God and we partake in the covenant, we are partaking into like a covenant of marriage and in the show too like when a when someone would get married they would take the cloak of the monarch and place it over the cloak of the spouse or the wife and they're putting their cloak of protection on them and that's one thing too remember that when we become into this covenant this marriage covenant now, it doesn't matter man or woman, you know, we're in the marriage covenant with Jesus. So when we come into this marriage covenant with him, 
we are cloaked under his hedge of protection. All right, so verse chapter 14, verse 4. And to the, pa- the place where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the only way to God, and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So as you can see here, he's telling them, You know the way. Jesus is the way. So the way to get to heaven, the way to get to the Father, is to know and have a relationship with Jesus. He is the way. Now let's go to verse 7. If you had really known me, you would also have known my Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. So as you go through and read through the Gospels, as you're walking with Jesus, when you're looking at the different, um, when you're reading the different lessons that he's giving, the teachings that he's given, how he interacted with the people, how he loved, he's giving an insight right there. So again, knowing, like knowing on a personal, knowing on a very intimate level. They're not talking about sex here, of course, but they're talking about like intimacy as in the true meaning like the true knowledge, like to really, truly know. They know God now because they really, truly know and have that intimate relationship with Jesus. And that's how we should be too. You know, once we get that real close, intimate relationship with Jesus, then we know God the Father. So now let's read John ten thirty. The Father and I are one. Okay, so we're going to go through and read. We'll read 10, 22 through 33, okay? At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. And you guys know that the Feast of Dedication is like the rededication of the temple or the Feast of Lights, Hanukkah. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple area in Solomon's portico. So the Jews surrounded him and began saying to him, How long you are going to keep us in suspense? If you are really the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, tell us so plainly and openly. How many times, like how many times when we are praying for something and and it's something that's like really bothering us and we really just need an answer and we need to know like we just need to know how many times do we tell god just give me a sign just tell me just plainly tell me i know i've done that quite a few times in my prayer life jesus answered them i have told you so yet you do not believe and then right there you know i just i was remembering a prayer that i had where i wanted to know if it was god or if it was me, like sometimes when you get a revelation about something or you have a vision about something, you don't know if it's your own imagination or if it's coming from God. I mean, you do know, like deep down, you know if it's you or not, but there's still that wavering little bit of disbelief in you where you're like, okay, God, is this really you or is this me? And right here he says, I have told you so, yet you do not believe. All right. The works that I do in my Father's name testify concerning me. They are my credentials and the evidence declaring who I am. But you do not believe me, so you do not trust and follow me, because you are not my sheep. That's strong right there. That is strong. The sheep that are my own hear my voice and listen to me. I know them and they follow me. 
There are times in my life where I hear, or I just, I don't know if I hear it or if I just know it. Like, I just know that I'm supposed to grab something from the house. Um, I'm going to give you an example of this one day, but I'm not saying this. I'm just sharing this to share an illustration. I believe God gives us illustrations in our lives to share about how he works and I'm not doing this to boast or anything like that, but it's just to share an illustration. Um, There was one day I was getting ready to leave. And before I left, I just knew that I needed to grab a sweatshirt. So I went to my closet and I found the sweatshirt that I was very attached to. But I just knew that it was time to give it to somebody else. And so I pulled it out, I put it in my car, and then before I left, I knew I was supposed to grab some communion cups. And I always have communion cups in the house because I do, there's nothing more intimate than taking communion and really focusing and meditating on Jesus. So I grabbed three communion cups and I went into my car and I was going somewhere. And there was somewhere that I was actually going to go to. But on the way there, not thinking, my car, like I just pulled to the left and turned into this parking lot, drove across the parking lot to the other street, and then I parked. And I saw a man on the corner, and this man was carrying a sign. He was looking for cash for money. And I got out of the car. And I wasn't sure if it, at first because it was a woman's sweatshirt. You know, like, why would I give a man a woman's sweatshirt? But I, I just decided to continue with it. So I took the communion cups and I took the sweatshirt and I went to the man. And I told him that I was supposed to give these to him, but I don't understand why I'm giving him a woman's sweatshirt. And then he told me that there's this woman in his life that needs one. So that it was for her and then I gave him the communion cups and I told him that you know the instructions on the communion cups and what to do and then I found out that he just gotten out of jail and during his time in jail he was actually um that during his time in jail he was a like ministering to other people and he was trying to get back on his feet but I didn't give him any money but I wasn't told to give him money. So, and there are other times where I'll be driving and I'll hear, give them something, you know, like give them money, give them something, give them a dollar. And I'll keep going because, well, one, like I'm in a different lane, but instead of making the effort to go into the other lane and give them the dollar, like right there could have been a blessing for somebody that I didn't listen to and I didn't hear. But I knew I wasn't in alignment with the other man because when I handed him everything, like I felt it, I felt it in my spirit that that was an alignment and maybe it brought back faith and belief to him. Maybe, you know, it, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know what the whole purpose was, but I do know that he needed it and God used me to give it to him. Just like when other people need things, he's going to use you to do something for someone else. We're all his children. He works through every single one of us. And it's important that we listen to his voice. And that we hear him. And that we know that it's him. And how do we know that it's him? Because His what he's telling us to do. Is going to line up with his word. The sheep that are my own. Hear my voice and listen to me. I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they will never, ever, by any means, perish. And no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. My Father who gives them to me is greater and mightier than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one in essence and in nature. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I show you many good works and many acts of mercy from the Father, for which of them 
are you stoning me? And the Jews answered him, We are not going to stone you for a good work, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, make yourself out to be God. I think we need to stop here for a moment and pause and reread through these scriptures. Go back through and read through John 1, 1 through 5 again. And then those scriptures that I gave you earlier, you know, really read through them. Break that scripture down. Highlight what stands out to you. And remember the power to bestow light. He is the hand of God. He is at the right hand of the gods. Like he is the hand of the king. He is the king. He is also like the next assessor, so forth. He is the heir. You know, he has all authority given to him, especially the power to bestow life. And the life was the light of man. Just think about that. Think about when you meet somebody or you know someone in your life that is full of darkness and whenever you're around them, how do they react? How do they treat you? You know, when your light shines through and you're happy, are they miserable because you're happy? Or do they try to leech on to you and to take in some of that happiness? You know, sit here, think about the words, meditate on this. And when you're done, come back and we'll continue. All right, now let's go ahead and continue. We're going to read Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This scripture right here tells us you know, number one, Jesus is the child that is to be born, and he is the son that is given. And if you look at the context, right, Isaiah is not putting this as in, this is going to happen. Like, as he writes it, it is, it has already happened. And we have to remember that God has no, con um, God's not confined to time. He is God. He's the creator of time, so he can move in and out of time as he pleases, right? Just as when Jesus was sacrificed on that cross, it wasn't just for those who were alive at that time that that atonement was made. It is for all, all who believe in him, all who follow him and love him. So that's from that moment, the past and the future, So let's read this again. He says, for to us, a child is born. Now, who is us that he is talking about? He's talking about all of God's children that Jesus was born for. To us, a son is given or an heir is given, right? Right? Because the son, the firstborn son of the father, is the heir of his kingdom, or of his land, or his possessions, right? So to us, a son is given, or an heir is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. Now remember, the way how it is, like there is a headship, that's symbolic for headship, right? So the weight of what's going on is on the shoulders of the Lord. And the headship. So the government, he is the headship of the government. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Here he has the same names as our Heavenly Father, which shows to us that he is God the Father. Jesus is a part of God the Father. He is, him and the Father is one. 
Now, one thing that I want to point out is when they're talking about the names. So when you look at royalty, when they speak of their names, you know, they say like, for an example, um, the Prince of Wales. Okay, so the Prince of Wales is used to define the heir, the direct heir to the throne. So that's why Prince Charles, when Queen Elizabeth was on the throne, Prince Charles was the Prince of Wales because he was the direct heir. Then, since he became king, now his son, um, is it Harry? Henry? I forgot what his son's name is, but he is, him and his wife, you know, they are the prince and princess of Wales because they are next in line to inherit the throne. So his name would be Jesus, the son of God, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Now let's go ahead and take a look at Romans 13, 1 through 9. I will use my Christian Standard Bible. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. If you want to be unafraid of the authority, do what is good, and you will have its approval. For as God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For he is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your consequence. And for the reason you pay taxes, since the authorities of God's servants continually attending to these tasks, pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those who owe taxes, tolls to those who owe tolls, respect to those who owe respect, and honor those who you owe honor. Do not owe anyone anything except love one another, and for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not, convert, do not covet, and any other commandments are summed up by the commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So as we look through and break this down, when he's talking about the governing authorities, um, first off, God is the headship of the government, right? It is God's authority, God's laws. Our government is supposed to be a representation of God's laws and God's love and God's, and they're supposed to honor God with everything. So when they say, um, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. So if you are obeying the laws, you have no reason to fear the authorities. Taken that the uh, those put in authority are supposed to be working for God and upholding God's laws and his righteousness. So verse 8, chapter 13, verse 8 is actually extremely good advice when it says, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. You see that right there? That's a key right there. How do you fulfill God's law? We love one another. And that's unconditional love of one another as Jesus loved us. Actually, I want to write that down. So now let's take a quick look at Daniel 2.44. In the days of those final ten kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will its sovereignty, sovereignty be left for another people, but it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, and it will stand forever.
Let's take a quick look at Revelation 11:15. Then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom, dominion rule of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now let's read Hebrews 4:12. For the word of God is living and active and full of power. Now, who is the Lord? Jesus. Jesus is living and active and full of power. Making it operative, energizing and efficient. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest part of our nature exposing and judging the very thoughts of in and intentions of the heart. Let's read again chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 7. He again sets a definite day, a new today, providing another opportunity to enter the, that rest by, saying through David, after so long a time, just as it has been said before in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. This mention of arrest was not a reference to their entering into canon. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak about another day of opportunity after that. So there remains a full and complete Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has once entered his rest has also rested from the weariness and pain of it, his human labors, just as God rested from those labors uniquely his own. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest of God, to know and experience it for ourselves, so that no one will fail by following the same example of disobedience of those who died in the wilderness. For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight. But all things are open and exposed and revealed to the eyes of him with whom we have given account. So everything we do, everything we think, everything that we act on or plan to act on, Jesus already sees it and he knows it. There is nothing that you do that, it, that he does not know. And as much then as we believers have great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith and cling tenaciously to our absolute trust in him as savior. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and temptations, but one who has been tempted knowing exactly how it feels to be human in every respect as we are years without committing any sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace, that is the throne of God's gracious favor, with confidence and without fear, so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find his amazing grace to help in time of need and appropriate blessings coming just at the right moment. Wow. So right there, they're saying the throne of grace. You find yourself in the midst of temptation, there is a way out of it. That's what this is saying. Jesus understands how it feels to be tempted because you remember he was tempted while he was in the wilderness right after his baptism. He was hungry and he was tempted. What the devil was trying to do at that time was to get him to use the deity in him. He wasn't telling him, if you are the son of God, because he wanted him to confirm to him because he was unsure. No, he knew who Jesus was. He knows who Jesus is. He was trying to get Jesus to listen to his flesh so that he would use the deity part in him because if Jesus would have fell for that, 
if he would have turned the stone into bread and ate it. Then right there, at that moment, going through the temptation, he would completely have made himself unqualified to be the sacrificial lamb. There are really good studies of that out on the internet. If you want to further research that, I could do a video explaining this a little bit better. But if Jesus would have obeyed any or gave in to any of Satan's temptations, it would have disqualified him. He had to go through those temptations as a man and he had to conquer it as a man. So he understands the feeling. He understands what you're going through when you're going through that battle. Like you know that you're not supposed to do this, but you really want to do this because you feel like you need to do this. Remember with him, he was hungry, you know, and one of our basic needs is to eat food. But, you know, like he was saying, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word of God. The word of God is him. The word of God is is the promises, it's the scriptures, it's everything that God has for us. We live through Him. I don't want to, um, I feel like I'm over explaining, so I apologize, but you know, I, I just think that's very important to know right there. You know, Jesus understands when you're struggling through something, so pray to Him. Say, God, help me. You know how this feels like. I need you to help me, give me the strength, because I don't have the strength on my own to do this. And you pray and you believe that you received what you prayed for. And you keep believing and you keep pushing forward because you know that Jesus went through all the temptations that he did. And he understands exactly what you're going through. Now let's read 1 Peter 9 through 17. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a special people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellence, the wonderful deeds, the virtues, and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world, to abstain from the sensual urges, those dishonorable desires that wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the unsaved Gentiles. Conduct yourself honorably with graciousness and integrity, so that for whatever reason they may slander you as evildoers, yet by observing your good deeds, they may instead come to glorify God in the day of visitation when he looks upon them with mercy. Submit yourselves to the authority of every human institution for the sake of the Lord to honor his name. Whether it is a king as one in a position of power or a gover governor sent by him to bring punishment to those who do wrong and to praise and encourage those who do right, for it is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence, muzzle, gag the culpable ignorance and irresponsible criticism of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover or pretext for evil, but use it and live as bond servants of God. Show respect for all people, treat them honorably, love the brotherhood of believers, Fear God and honor the king. Servants may be submissive to your masters with all proper respect, not only to those who are good and kind, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this, is the, for this finds favor. If a person endures the sorrow of suffering unjustly because of an awareness of God or the will of God, after all, what kind of credit is there if when you do wrong you are punished for it then endure it patiently. But if, you, if when you do what is right and patiently bear undeserved suffering, this finds favor with God. For as a believer, you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ suffered for you, 
leaving you an example so that you may follow his footsteps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit ever found in his mouth. While being revealed and insulted, he did not reveal or insult in return while suffering. He made no threats of vengeance, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges fairly. He personally carried our sins on his body to the cross, willingly offering himself on it as on an altar of sacrifice so that we might die to sin, becoming immune from the penalty and power of sin and live for righteousness for by his wounds for you who believe and have been healed. For you were continually wandering like so many sheep, but now you have come back to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Now let's read Psalm twenty-two, twenty-two. I will tell of your name to my countrymen in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. We'll continue. You who fear the Lord with all inspired reverence, praise him. All of your descendants of Jacob, honor him. Fear him with submission, wonder, all of you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor detested the suffering of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he listened. My praise will be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows made in the time of trouble before those who reverently fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who diligently seek him and require him as their greatest need will praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. And the ends of the earth will remember to turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down and worship before you. For the kingship and the kingdom are the Lord's and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship and those who will go down to the dust, the dead, will bow before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive, prosperity will serve him. Let's take a look at Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fulfillness of it, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the streams and rivers. Who may ascend unto the mountain of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to what is false, nor has sworn oaths deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation description of those who diligently, who diligently seek him and require him as their greater need, who seek your face, even as did Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up ancient doors that the King of glory may come in. Who is he then, the King of glory, the Lord of hosts? He is the King of glory who rules over all creation with his heavenly armies. I want you to think of something here as we look at Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. What they're talking about here is the head, right? Remember, I don't know if you remember in the beginning I think it was a Bible study or the first few chapters. You know, we talked about the gates. We have your mind, your eyes, your ears, your mouth. These are all gates to the innermost part of you. You got to be careful what you hear. And it's important to speak out the word of God and to hear yourself saying these words out loud. It's important for you to hear the word of God. It's important for you to hear worship and praises. It's important for you to take note and be careful what you see and what you let in through your eyes. Remember the old saying, the eyes are the windows to the soul. You can see the light shine through your eyes, right? Be careful what you speak of, what you say, your oaths. Are you speaking lies? Are you speaking deceitfully? Are you slandering somebody else? 
be careful what you say. These are the gates to the soul, to the innermost death part of you. These are the gates. So open up your gates and allow God to come in and rest inside of you. All right, let's read Hebrews 1, 3. He is the radiance, the radiance of glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay. So we know right here, he, which is Jesus, Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God. So he is the light of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Everything Jesus did, everything Jesus said, everything, every move Jesus made. He is the exact imprint of the nature of God, his compassion and love for the people. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He created everything because he is the word of God. As God spoke it, when he spoke it, it was Jesus, right? So he, and we said that God holds the universe in his hands. Jesus holds the universe. He uprights it in his hands. After making purification for sins, he was our atonement for our sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So remember how I was talking about the hand of God. He sat at the right hand of, of God our Father. And he would not have sat down unless all of his work was done. I know this is the last week and the last lesson, but I do have an assignment and I'm going to do this assignment as well. My assignment is to read the book of John, take it slow, pray first and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the keys. Pay attention to Jesus, pay attention to his parables and his character how he acts with the people, how he shows unconditional love. Basically what you're doing by reading the Gospels and starting in John is you are walking with him. And as you're walking with him, really put yourself into the scriptures. Use your imagination on this. Imagine you're, sta you're sitting there on a rock watching him speak and give a sermon. Imagine you're one-on-one -on -one with him, talking with him. All right, well, let's go ahead and say our closing prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we invite you to come in and spend time with us. Jesus, we know and confess with our lips that you came from the Father because you and the Father are one. We thank you, Jesus, that as your body, we are one with you. Help lead us to grow and develop a deeper relationship with you and help us love as you love. In Jesus' name, amen. Spend a little bit of time over the next few days re-reading through the scriptures and seeking to gain a stronger, deeper relationship with Jesus because it is through him we come close to our Heavenly Father. And I hope that now if you haven't already, that you have a more clear understanding of who God our Father is and Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and how he loves us. And I hope you're able to take the knowledge that you learned and to pass it on to somebody else. Because remember, just like we read in scripture, that we are called to be a royal priesthood. It is our opportunity and duty as Christians to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. All right, this includes our five-week lesson Bible study. I thank you again for joining me these last five weeks, and I do appreciate every single one of you. Shalom.